Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Vegan Proteins Muscles by Brussels Radio. My name is Danny. And I'm Giacomo. And this is our 97th episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope that everybody in the States, at least, had a really nice Thanksgiving. I think the last time we recorded, it wasn't quite Thanksgiving. I forget. When is the Canada Thanksgiving? I do not remember. And every year when my Canadian clients tell me, oh, it's Thanksgiving this week. And I'm always like, oh, yeah, huh, neat. It's at a different time. And every year I forget when that is. Right. And this makes me feel more and more embarrassed as an ignorant American because <laughs> then there's other countries celebrations. And I'm pretty sure that different countries do it up during other times of the year or don't even celebrate Thanksgiving, I would imagine. Right. But here we are in general. I think The reality is that it's the end of the year, and one way or another, in one way, shape, or form, we're all gathering with family for various reasons, not excluding the fact that we all stand to benefit from continuing to pour into our social cup to make it a little fuller, even over full, if you will, because, hey, it's past couple years have been kind of cray, been kind of crazy in terms of like just gathering, getting together socializing with family, friends, colleagues. I don't know about you, Danny, but I feel it when I talk to my clients and I just hear what they're doing. And it's like, it almost seems like people are on overdrive right now. Oh yeah, absolutely. I get tired listening to people talk about all the stuff that they have to do. I am so not that person, that person that has a thousand different social events on their agenda that's like excited about it. That's it's a lot for me. And as it is, we actually have quite a bit going on and I'm already tired. If I'm being honest, we (laughs) we went to (laughs) Brooklyn last weekend uh, to see family, which was great because we haven't seen them in a long time. Giacomo's family and Giacomo thought he was going to go this weekend. But now he's like, "Mm, actually, that'll be kind of a lot. And then. On Wednesday of next week, we head out to Las Vegas for the Mr. Olympia, and we'll be there for like six days. Then we come home. It's immediately Giacomo's birthday, then Christmas, then Daisy's birthday. Then we head back out to New York for New Year's for four days. I'd be lying if I said that sentence, that run-on sentence didn't make me a little bit tired. But honestly, when I heard Mr. O in Vegas, my brain immediately went to the fun, which is the escape room that we're going to that is themed from the set of Saw and it has, there's acting involved. (laughs) I don't even know. Weren't you the one who was mad at me for taking you to this Christmas haunted house last week and now you're excited about being in a Saw escape room six days before Christmas? It's an escape room. It's not Christmas themed, okay? Frightmare Before Christmas, they caught me off guard so (laughs) badly. And then at the end, I I know I'm skipping to the end as usual, but like Danny points to the sign and it's like, look, the children can get scared at this time of the year. This is another haunt during Valentine's Day. This is a haunt during, I'm like, there are haunts all year long. Like, are you kidding me? And I'll tell you what, I thought I was going into it with an open mind and I was just going to enjoy the experience. But, and, and I did, but like, it also freaked me out a bit because Oh, I just wasn't expecting to feel fear and terror during Christmas time. I just, I want to feel joy. And I'm like, I can't feel joy. Thanks, Danny. Oh, they got him so good. So since Giacomo is literally among the worst storytellers alive, what happened was <laughs> I took him to a haunted house that we've been to before. We've gone there multiple times at Halloween for, you know, a regular old Halloween haunted house, but they have this thing called Frightmare Before Christmas, apparently, and it's the same haunted house, but it is now decorated for spooky Christmas, and all of the ghouls are dressed up as, like, you know, evil elves or evil Santa. There were some really terrifying gingerbread men. Ginger dead men. Ginger dead men. (laughs) (laughs) And I was just... Having the time of my life, Krampus, of course, was everywhere, Um, and I thought that it was absolutely awesome. But see, Giacomo is not fun at the haunted houses during Halloween. He, like, doesn't jump. He doesn't get scared. Eh, It's, he's, that's just what he does. But my God, they got him so many times at this, I think, because his brain was just, like, not on that channel, you know, and, uh, ugh, would, would go again. 10 out of 10. 
Right. So if you're listening to this and you wind up going to a haunt that is Christmas themed and you regret it after the fact, blame Danny, <laughs> not me. She put me up to this. Anyway, we're not talking about any of that stuff today. Today, what we are going to be talking about is something that I think so many people struggle with and sometimes don't even realize it. And that is a fear of failure and how that fear of failure keeps you stuck and what to do about it. Failure is a thing. And there is no denying the fact that we will all fail at some point in our life at something we care deeply about. The question here is, what do you do about the fear that surrounds failure, right? That's what we're talking about today. So I think the first thing that we should do over here is define what the fear of failure actually is. Like, where does it come from? Where is this? What is this rooted in, essentially? And there's various things that can cause the fear of failure, right? Did you know what the fear of failure is called? Like, there's a word for it? A title of something or other. <laughs> a tichophobia, right? A touchophobia? A, t- a tichophobia is the fear of failure, and a telephobia is the fear of imperfection. So they actually are pretty similar. But go ahead, continue. <laughs> Yeah, so Danny's getting all, uh, def- like, she's defining it, right, with the word, like, that that word over there. I honestly can't recall ever coming across either of those words, but it makes sense when you define it, right? The fear of imperfection and the fear of failure are very closely related, and I think one can lead to the other, and it really depends which one you start with. I think it really depends on what kind of person you are or what your experiences have been, And rather than sit here and like armchair diagnose, why don't we just like go through some common themes around the fear of failure and where it can come from. So obviously you have your upbringing to that defines who you are, whether it's your colleagues, your family, your friends, the experiences that you come across, you are shaped as a child and that stuff plays out as an adult. There's no denying it. Right. So let's say that you had an unsupportive environment or a teacher that challenged you really hard and you didn't feel like you could live up to their expectations or some sort of traumatic event or traumatic experience in life. That stuff from earlier years in life can play out as an adult and affect your behavior and whether and how you look at failure and how it affects you like before the fact and while you're trying to achieve something. Yeah, definitely. I think families can set people up to be afraid of failing, failing like failing is not allowed, you know, in certain families. I feel like failure is, yeah, that's the best way to put it. It's just not allowed. It is not accepted. You are like loved less when you perform less. So you learn very early on to constantly, you know, achieve, achieve, achieve. And I also think that like other people that are really set up to be afraid of failure are actually like gifted children, like children who are gifted. They are so used to excelling at pretty much everything that they touch from the moment they like enter school. Right. They're excellent at reading, at math, at history, at science, gold stars, A pluses on everything. But that actually is only likely for most people up to a certain point. Like most people hit high school or sometimes college and all of a sudden like it's harder and you're not even like particularly good at studying, right? Because you never had to, because you used to be able to just ace stuff without studying. So now you're up against situations where you're probably going to do poorly on these tests. You don't even know how to cope with that because you've not, uh, You've not ever, you know, seen a D on a test before. So how do you cope with that? And you don't even have the skills to not do that in the future because you weren't taught them when you were younger because you could get away without actually learning how to study. And then you're like paralyzed from that point. You're just like, oh, my God, I suck. I've peaked. Everything's over. I'm, you know, terrified of doing anything. And a lot of people just like freeze right there. Sometimes for years and years and years. 
Right. So you freeze, and then you forget where all this stuff is coming from. But when you peel back the layers, the stuff that you're facing, it's very real, right? You want It affects your self-esteem. It can provoke shame that you're unaware of, mm-hmm. like you're not good enough, like you're never going to be good enough. That stuff is scary, and it holds you back, right? It can affect how you operate on a daily basis, whether it's panic, whether it's just basic anxiety that can steamroll over thing, things that you're trying to do. And then like your your finger starts pointing, whether it's pointing at yourself or others or your environment, you're like, you're looking for blame, you're looking for reason, you're looking for cause. And all the while, like that can lead to procrastination or just like you plugging away at the wrong thing, right? Success on the surface doesn't even necessarily equate to like what it could look like on a deeper level when you really do something well to the absolute best of your capabilities, when you become a, a person who can grow and evolve and adapt to doing things better well, to doing things more, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to just like being obsessed with the success at any cost. Yeah. And, and when this comes to fitness and training and, you know, the things in our arena, because all of this stuff is true across pretty much the entire spectrum of anything a human can do. You could be afraid of failure and not go for a job promotion. You could be afraid of failure and not, you know, get married to your partner or have kids or, you know, things that you want to do them, but you're too scared of the possible negative outcomes. So you just decide you're not going to do them. But in our arena, specifically, uh, you know, nutrition, training, physique goals, mindset around those things. There are a lot of people who the thought of failing, the thought of setting, for example, like a physique goal or a weight loss goal or something, the thought of setting that goal and failing at reaching it is too painful to even try. And it's it's just such a hard thing to see people who really want X but they're not going to they're not going to take the steps to do it because they're not even going to commit to it because they're too afraid that they're not going to reach it and all of the feelings associated with that failure. So that that's that's the area in which we really work with people. That's crappy because like you want to tell someone trust the process. However, going with the flow only works to a point. At some point you have to do some reflection and realize like this ain't working and this is something that is I have to dig into mindset wise, right? And sometimes it's a matter of mental health. Sometimes it's just a matter of of reframing your approach and just like understanding what you're good at and what you're bad at and making it work. Or like trusting that it's gonna happen. Like you don't have to force it, right? Mm-hmm. Because you've put in the work. You've put in the work on paper and you don't have to force it. Uh, you're gonna do it. Like you become more skillful over time. You just gotta let it play out. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that, like, you know, having unrealistic expectations again of perfection, right? So again, the fear of failure and the fear of imperfection, they really go hand in hand because a lot of people would actually be thrilled to reach their goal imperfectly, but they can't envision it. They can only envision getting there perfectly. And anything short of that in their mind is failure. Even if the outcome is the same. And I might, I would actually add that with the inevitable stumbling blocks that happen when trying to reach any goal, the outcome is actually better. Think back to that gifted kid that I talked about. Compare that gifted kid who's now in college and doesn't know how to study because they've never had to before. Compare that to their classmate who really had to work hard to get B's all through middle school, high school, now they're in college, the classes are just as hard, but hey, they learned something with all their struggles. They at least know how to study. So now they're probably going to get better grades than the gifted kid who is like, oh, I suck at this. I'm not even going to bother. Like, I'm not instantly good at this. No. (laughs) Um, So yeah, like achieving things imperfectly, I actually think puts you in a better position at the end, even if the result is the same. Well, that beckons the question, how do you feel about it? Because I think that school teaches you to feel pleasure when it comes to scoring high. School rewards you. I mean, I'm not sure how it was out here, but in New York City, 
you are literally, school's a business. And the better your school does, the higher grades that your school gets, the more high... Well, yours were all private schools. It's a little different around here. <laughs> no, no. I'm talking about the public school system. Oh, well, with public schools here, yeah, the higher the scores the kids get, the more money they're going to get. Exactly. So now imagine that in a city of 10 million people and like the co- the fierce competition for funding, right? So it's like your school, schools are, are forced to teach kids to like be exceptional mm-hmm. because it's a business and that's yeah. how the school's going to get more. That's a whole, I feel like we're getting into a whole different conversation because I feel mm-hmm. like that actually just forces schools to teach to the test, which leaves all of this other stuff that kids never learn because they're just teaching kids to make sure they pass this test so they can get funding. All kinds of pitfalls. Se- separate. I could talk about that all day too. But That's an aside. Uh, but I get. I get what you're saying. Yeah, we we are rewarded. Our brains are rewarded when we do well. Like our brains love that. And I would. I would say now in 2022, probably even more so with social media. Like our brains are just absolutely just hardwired for these little dopamine hits constantly. So when we're doing something and we're not immediately getting rewarded by being good at it, we are frustrated and very likely to quit. Why don't we tie this into gains? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. How does this impact how you feel about yourself when you're putting the effort in, the time and the effort with training, the time and the effort with becoming more skillful with your nutrition and with your eating patterns and habits with all of that, right? And you're like, you don't, you you just grow impatient, right? Because you want to be instantly rewarded for the work that you're putting in. Or you can't see, you're missing the forest for the trees, right? You want to look a certain way, but you become disappointed when you put the work in and you realize like, oh, you know, this is a long game. How you want to look in one year is going to take five years. And how do you, let that play out and still enjoy the process. Uh, It's very hard. It's like anything else. It takes a lot of practice. I think committing yourself to a goal that sort of reveals itself very, very slowly, like delayed gratification of the result. I think it just takes a crap load of practice, you know, sitting there doing the thing and not really being rewarded for it for a long time until you get there. Not to say there aren't little rewards along the way, right? Like hitting any PR in the gym, that's a reward. You know, even if you can't see the muscle being built in those spots yet, if you're hitting PRs and you're eating enough, you're building muscle there, you know? So, but you can't always see it and it's really easy to pull the plug on that or to start feeling like, you know, again, that pain, the pain of feeling like I'm putting in all of this work and I'm still failing. It is so painful. I know you kind of felt that way a little bit at the end of your prep. Like, I can't believe I put in all that work and it still wasn't enough to end up exactly where I wanted to be. While simultaneously reflecting and realizing that there are another five years that I need to put in to tie it all together. Because right now, or I should say, when I say right now, I mean the past five, past five years, I tried to even out my symmetry from top to bottom. And there's only so much you can do right? So I'm trying to be bigger up top and smaller on the bottom because that's just, that's just me. I'm in balance. I'm, I'm bottom heavy. So there's sacrifices that need to be made, but that doesn't mean that I'm immune to feeling crappy about that, right? Like my upper body was a little bigger, my lower body. I'm like, oh, I wish I would have had better glutes. I would have had better striations on my glutes, you know, but it's like, you can only do so much. You need to get bigger everywhere, Giacomo. That's what I'm saying to myself. But you can only do so much. You can only do so much at once. It's it's going to take another five years. And you got to accept those consequences when you're doing one thing. And in general, maybe you did miss the mark. You start to look at regrets. Maybe I should have trained my legs harder. I mean, speaking in terms of my own personal experience. But I Right, digress. but I'm talking about the fear of failure and the pain of putting in so much work to mm-hmm. still feel like you failed. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you get to, it takes away from your experience. And the point to not drive home here, but to start bringing up is that success is a combination of failures that happen over the course of time. Like you're never going to, you're just not going to find success unless you accept the fact that there is trial and error, there are failures, and that is the path to 
real to being truly successful at something. If you don't accept that path, you will not find success. Mm-hmm. I would also say success in and of itself is is uh, subjective, you know, because I look at your prep and I don't think, oh, he failed. <laughs> but I know there have been moments where you felt like that. So, you know, if you're listening to this, sometimes you what you think might be failure, other people would not think is failure. Other people might think is success. So just something to keep in mind. Well, here's the deal. When you look at success and you redefine failure, you realize that through failure, you gather new information, you gain new skills, and you develop new strategies. And you can't get any of that without Without framing... the struggle. Without framing failure as a necessary and a good thing because that's where all that stuff comes from as opposed to the alternative where you just freeze up and you're like, (laughs) this is painful. This feels bad. This was failure. And then what happens? You just, you avoid doing the thing going forward. And then you don't, you don't have consistency. You don't have a routine. And before you know it, you turn around and you're like, damn, three to five years pass. I didn't do what I wanted to do. Now you have regret. Mm -hmm. And now you're just like, what's the point of trying? Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's a terrible way to, uh, to go through, um, life as far as something you're truly passionate about and you want to do. And uh, no one's immune to, to that kind of experience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to botch this story. So please, if anybody's listening to this, bear with me because I do not know much about baseball. But I was listening to this story about Lou Gehrig. And again, I might, I might botch the details here a bit. Lou Gehrig was one of the best hitters of all time, certainly in his time. And he missed 60% of his shots. 60%. Missing 60% of the time put him in the best hitters of all time. I don't know if that's true now, but in, in his day, it definitely was. And it just goes to show, like, you know, if you're somebody who is easily discouraged by failure and you're missing 60% of your metaphorical shots, you're going to feel like failure. (laughs) You know, you're going to give up a lot. If you're failing 60% of the time, that means you're only hitting 40% of the time. You know, 40% in school, that's an F. That's a big fat F. So, you know, keeping with it and recognizing that every, every little success is actually a step forward, and most failures are an opportunity to learn how to do better. And I just thought that was a really interesting t- statistic because I was thinking about like, oh, if that was me, would I have kept? Would I have felt successful if I was missing sixty percent of my shots? Like, I don't know, man. But in the grand scheme, it made him one of the best ever. So, very interesting stuff. And I should fact check that story, but even theoretically. It's a fascinating story. Yeah, I honestly did not know that. And well, you might not still, because that might not be accurate. (laughs) (laughs) I should Google it. Have you guys heard of the Vegan Cruise? If not, we want to tell you about it because we are so excited to be presenters on the 2023 cruise, and we would love to see you guys there. So the Vegan Cruise is exactly what it sounds like and so much more. It's a cruise from March 17th to March 24th that leaves from Miami and will be visiting Belize, Honduras, Costa Maya, and the Bahamas on the beautiful MSC Divinia. It is so cool to wake up in a new country every day of the trip, seriously. But as if that wasn't enough, one of the biggest drawbacks of most cruises is that there's nothing vegan to eat. I had a client actually go on a cruise recently and she said she was shocked at how little she could eat and for that price, it just was not worth it for her. But that's not a problem on this cruise because all three meals are fully catered, vegan, and made by gourmet chefs. You will never be hungry. There are also get togethers like ice cream socials and pizza parties out by the pool. Very fun. And to top all of that off, the cruise is absolutely loaded with some of the biggest leaders in the vegan movement, giving lectures, presentations, and classes. Folks like Dr. Greger, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Clapper, Robert Cheek, Juliana Hever, and so many more. And of course us. We will be hosting exercise classes and giving presentations on plant-based fitness. And of course, we would very much love to spend time with any of our listeners who come out. So if you're interested, click the link in the show notes to book your spot because it always sells out. 
and mention vegan proteins when you book and you'll get a $50 onboarding credit at the vegan bookstore. We look forward to vacationing with you guys. Well, I think to simplify with Danny's example, it's you can't succeed at what you don't try Mm -hmm. to fail at. And it's not like you want to fail, but you do expect it. You expect it when you want success Mm -hmm. is the bottom line. And how you process that, I think that's going to vary person to person. Like you take a person who is obsessed with achievement and excellence and perfection and visualizing success for them may be helpful. But if you take someone who's scared of trying and feels that kind of feels fear in that way, visualizing success could actually put them in a bad mood. You know, and make it harder for them. So I think a pro, it's all relative. Like you got to know yourself when it comes to processing fear around failure. Yeah. And you're right. You, you, you miss every opportunity that you don't take. You miss every single one. And sometimes, you know, sometimes this isn't even about taking the first step, you know, because some people take the first step and find some success with something and then they get scared of going further. It's almost like they're afraid of too much success. You know what I mean? Like you see this sometimes in people's jobs where they are pretty successful in the beginning, but then they get, they just like never innovate ever again. Um, Or, you know, creative people who, I see this a lot on, with creators on like YouTube or something. They're, they'll make an awesome video. It'll blow up, right? The video will blow up on YouTube. Now their channel has a half a million subscribers or something. And then they are scared shitless from that point out to do anything else because that fear of becoming too successful or like losing that success that they've found so far by making a misstep, it's like too much for them. Um it's almost like a phenomena of people that sort of go viral on the internet and they just like freak out afterwards and kind of disappear. Um, you know, people get a taste of success and go, ah, I don't want to lose this. And then they just are paralyzed and don't know what to do. And I do see that in some people with fitness and nutrition as well. They get some success and then they like can't take it further than that because of something, because of something inside of them that is probably very different from person to person, but a lot of it comes back down to this, like, fear of failure or fear of losing what success they've got at this point. And that leads them to where? Nowhere. Literally nowhere. Like, right where they are, or sometimes backsliding. Or creating new problems, perhaps, that weren't even there in the first place. Oh, yeah, that's a possibility also. Yeah. So what do you do about it? If you are somebody who is so afraid of failure that you don't take steps in the directions of your goals that you want to go in, what do you do? How do you overcome this? That is a very good question, and I think there are no easy answers here. I think reflection is really going to help. And analyzing your path, like what got you to the point where you're experienced, starting to experience failure. Are you there or are you afraid of failing so you're not actually failing? I think that's the first question to ask yourself. Uh, More often than not, when you start doing some analyzing and thinking critically about where you're at, you'll realize that you probably have already experienced some failures. Start with that as opposed to like, oh my gosh, I'm afraid to fail, so I'm not trying hard enough. Because then you're stuck in that that thing where you're just like pushing harder and you're fighting nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you turn around, it's like this battle with myself, I created. It's self-perpetuated. I'm not achieving and it's all because I was so afraid to fail that I'm not even aware of what my failures actually are. And I'm just like literally doing nothing. I'm just spinning my wheels. So you could be stuck. That's one example. The other example is I think the more constructive one where you're like, where have I actually failed? Whether they're big or small, become aware of your failures and then analyze and process and think critically about what they are because once you do that, you'll realize where you have found success. And you can hold on to a little bit of that because that will help you feel pleasure and that's a good motivator. And then you can experience the pain of the failures that you've that you've experienced 
and you can process what you can do better or what kind of changes you can make. That's how you gather information on yourself. You know, like you could be like your own little science project and start to think about ways that you can improve and grow as an athlete. Is any of that ringing true to your ears? Kind of. Yeah, kind of? it just sounds like reviewing yourself, I guess. It's a performance review for yourself. <laughs> More or less. Um, I would add to that that you know, trying to let go of that all or nothing mentality, that perfect or nothing mentality, because usually that just leaves you with nothing, actually. Um, So trying to let go of that, I think is really important. Also, I would say when you are laying your goals out, when you're deciding what your goals are, when it comes to fitness, you don't want it to just be, I want to lose 20 pounds. What do you want to learn? Like add a learning piece to that. Like, I want to lose 20 pounds and learn how to navigate social settings around food would be a good example. Like, what can you learn from it? It's not just achieving the thing. When you recognize that there's something that you want to learn from a situation, you're usually more likely to accept the fact that when you're learning something, there might be a hurdle to learning it. It's, It's like a growth mindset, like recognizing... That in order to grow and change, you're going to buck up against some hiccups. That's literally the point, right? If there was no friction, you would never change. I would say to work on visualizing all possible outcomes. What does this look like if you totally bomb? What does this look like if you succeed? What does this look like if you just quit? What does it look like with all scenarios in between? When you can kind of visualize that, particularly the worst case scenario, I find most of the time you realize like, oh, well, I guess that's not so bad, actually. If that happens, if that's the worst thing that can happen, all right, I guess I'll give it a shot then. You know, it's just easier to make peace with doing it if the worst case scenario is, you know, something that you can tolerate. So, you know, sometimes it's not something you can tolerate. That's okay, too. You know, no one's saying you have to do every single thing that scares you. But if you can tolerate it, usually it's worth it's worth trying and you're more able to negotiate with yourself about that. Yeah, fair enough. I think that the risk you run with getting too swept up in that kind of mindset, though, or that kind of assessing things, I think the risk that you could run is indecisiveness because... If you're caught up with thinking about something so much and playing out so many scenarios, you could turn around and so much time has passed and you haven't done anything. So I do think there there's some pitfalls, there's some flaws, some cracks in that way of being. But I also feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of merit to what you're saying. Right, because it's really helpful to think through stuff, mm-hmm. and sometimes it's just not worth it to just plug away at something fearlessly and gamble on yourself. Because if the regret and resentment after the fact cripples you, then was it worth it? Like you turn around and right. you see yourself out of the game, mm-hmm. and that's not good either. Yeah, I guess my last piece of advice is probably my favorite piece of advice because I always save my favorite piece of advice for last is to deliberately go do something that you know you are going to suck at. That has been such a huge thing for me because, spoiler, this is 100% me, guys. I'm the I'm afraid of failure. I'm the perfectionist. I was the gifted kid who suddenly thought when I was 18 years old, like, oh, I'm actually an idiot <laughs> because I never had to try hard for anything uh, academically up until that point. But finding and deliberately going to do things that I know I'm not going to be good at. Hey, guys, remember when I ran that 5K last year? That was not because I thought I was going to be an awesome runner. It's because I knew I was going to suck at it and that it was going to be hard and that everybody was going to be faster than me and that my not great, not like particularly challenging goals were going to be very challenging for me and learning to be okay with that. And, you know, running was not a one and done for me. Like I had, I had to, I had to train for that 5k because I am so not a runner. 
And every single stinking training run that I went out there to do it was hard <laughs> and felt like failure most of the time um, because I wanted to stop every single second that I was doing it, but I didn't. So, you know, just getting comfortable not being the best at something in the room, I think is pretty awesome. Like, picking up an instrument. Giacomo just started taking singing lessons. That's not something you're just like naturally amazing at, right? Like it's a weird feeling, <laughs> I got to say. Sometimes it's kind of interesting because I'm hearing my voice, my singing voice, and it's like making me think about my pitch and my tone, and it's a little uncomfortable. I got to say, like I'm hearing myself uh, sing more loudly than I normally would, and I'm like, mm -hmm. "Oh gosh." Mhm. Mm do I sound okay? I'm not ever going to be very good at this, especially not compared to you. Like, this is, you have a trained voice. So, but that's also something that motivated me. I knew compared to you that I would not be very good at it. So what did I do? I did something that I knew I wouldn't be very good at. And I mm -hmm. felt like I had the support emotionally because it makes me feel closer to you because you're really good at it. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with having accountability uh, with someone else or being motivated by someone else who's very good at something, being mm -hmm. inspired, if you will, that could be helpful. But yeah, I mean, I, the fact is like as human beings, we want to do things we're good at, right? It feels good to do something and be really good at it. It feels awesome to do something and be the best person in the room at it. Like, wow. And when, it, when that happens, it's really cool. But like, if you always expect expect that to happen or you think less of yourself like how arrogant you know how arrogant to expect yourself to always be the best person in the room and I feel like that's the hardest thing about this entire conversation is that a lot of time this fear of failure or fear of imperfection like yes on one hand it definitely decreases your self-esteem and you don't feel particularly great about yourself, but it's coming from a place of almost like expecting yourself to be the best at everything, which is an incredibly egocentric way to think of yourself, you know? So just recognizing that dichotomy of like, wait, I don't think I'm all that. Like, why do I expect myself to be the, like, pick up running and just be awesome at it? Or for you to pick up singing and just be awesome at it? Or or chess or weightlifting or bodybuilding or whatever, like for 99% of people, that's not going to be the case. Like only 1% of people are going to be freaking awesome at any particular thing that they try right out of the gate. So I think we need to let go of some of that like arrogance or self-centeredness that expects us to be the best in the room all the time well, and yeah. be okay mm -hmm. with being like average at something or even sucky at something you'll get better hey listeners we hope you've been enjoying this episode and we appreciate your love of all things vegan fitness for those of you who want even more support on your vegan fitness journey check out our muscles by brussels community and become a member by joining the team you are one of our exclusive vips as a member you'll find over 200 macro friendly high protein recipes that can meet any of your meal planning needs. You'll also receive training programs that update monthly. This training has progressive overload built into it, so you can be sure if you're following the program, you are making progress. All of this and more is located inside our Vegan Proteins members only app. As a Muscles by Brussels member, you'll unlock bonus courses, challenges, and more every month. You'll also be invited to our live Zoom video calls, which happen two times a month and they're absolute gold to those who show up. And if you can't make the calls, don't worry. You have the opportunity to email us whenever you want. You'll receive a video response to all of your questions from one of the coaches here at Vegan Proteins every time you message us. Members also receive 40% off many of our other services. And of course, our private community of like-minded individuals is like no other. Best of all, you can try this membership out for a full month at no cost to you with this special offer for our listeners only because we appreciate and want to fully support you. 
Use the link in our show notes to sign up for your free trial today. We hope to see you on our next live coaching call. So if you're listening to this, I want to know what is the thing that you are going to try that you fully expect to suck at it first. Let us know. Leave us a comment on any of our socials or shoot us a DM or an email coach at veganproteins.com. I want to know, are you afraid of failure? And if you are, what is the thing you're going to try? What's the next step you're going to take? All right, moving on to our question and answer segment here. We have, do I need to warm up before lifting weights? I usually do 10 minutes on the treadmill or elliptical to get my heart rate up, but is that really all that helpful? Glute activation on leg days? Can I just walk straight to the weights? I have separate cardio days. There are a couple good things in there. I think that doing five to 10 minutes of cardio, low intensity before you start training, I think that could be a helpful way to get the blood pumping and to get your body used to moving. I think that even more important than that though is to gently stretch your muscles out meaning to not do like what most people think of when it comes to stretching and warm up is like they think okay I'm going to hold some stretches for like a minute or 2 minutes you know from head to toe and we stretch for like 10 to 15 minutes it's so common that's what people think they should be doing before they work out and in actuality you wind up loosening your muscles a bit too much and you want your muscles to be a little bit taut before you train because then you can contract them better but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't stretch and you shouldn't warm up before you train dynamic That's the word to remember, dynamic. Dynamic stretching, short holds, anywhere from like two to 10 seconds tops. And you can repeat that like 10 times per body part. So in other words, say you're doing forward bends to stretch out your hamstrings, bend over, bend down, do a, a, you know, do that, hold at the bottom for like two, come back up and repeat that for 10 times. Those kinds of stretches and a total of like, say five to 10 minutes tops before you train is more than enough. And you can create a series of upper body stretches before you train upper body or end a series of lower body stretches before you train lower body. Spoiler alert, we can give you access to upper and lower body stretching routines when you have a membership to our Muscles by Brussels community. <laughs> Shameless plug right there. But anyways, yeah, dynamic stretching, five to ten minutes. I would say five minutes of that and five minutes of cardio. That's like a perfect way to warm up before you start training. I would also say you can warm up with the barbell. If you're going to go do squats, for example, do a few sets with just the barbell or a much lighter weight than you'd normally use, work your way up. Just, just for, you know... If you're going to do sets of 10, maybe do a couple sets of, you know, six or then move a little weight up and then do three, et cetera, until you get to your working weight. And I like to do this for pretty much all of the compound exercises that I do. I do one or two just quick little warm up sets before I get to my working weight, just to like let the body know what's coming. Mm -hmm. And some of the isolation stuff before the compound stuff is helpful too, like to your point of glute activation before you start doing squats? Yeah, absolutely. You don't want to like train the glutes super hard, like do some working sets, but a cup, like maybe two sets of hip thrusts or like two sets of monster walks to start to make your hips a little more pliable before you train and, and get on the barbell with no weight and see how you're moving. Like, I think that's a nice little routine too. So yeah, I guess it depends on how you're lifting and what your goals are as well. But good points, Danny. This question's for you. I'm looking for some pointers here. I'm training a naturally very slim man to put on weight and muscle, but I'm having difficulty with getting their abs trained. Everything's looking good, but the midsection area is not very toned. Okay, so it's a thin man who's Mm -hmm. trying to put on weight and muscle, and everything's looking good except the abs. So assuming that this that you're training this person, you know, and they're in a caloric surplus, which they have to be in order to gain weight for sure and muscle, then, you know, that's a lot of food going through the stomach and the digestive tract. And a lot of times that's going to make the stomach look fuller. It's going to make the stomach look a little bit more bloated. And that alone can kind of make the midsection not look awesome. That's part of the building phase. There's nothing... 
wrong or weird about that, just when you're building muscle, usually, especially as the day wears on, the stomach region does not look as good. Totally fine. Um, it could also be, you know, in order to gain muscle and gain weight, it's not going to be purely muscle. Wouldn't that be lovely if we could just gain purely muscle? But we can't. There will be some fat gain as well. And with men, they tend to store body fat in their stomach and their low back, whereas like women store more of it in their hips and butt and thighs. Generally, these are generalizations. So it's possible that there's just a little bit of body fat being accumulated there, which is not necessarily a problem, especially if their weight is still fine. Sometimes at the beginning of a building phase, you know, the weight jumps and it doesn't look so good right off the bat, but then there's like a little bit of recomposition that happens for a while and that same weight starts to look better and better and better. So that could be it too. So basically I'm saying like, it's okay. Don't freak out. Don't change anything. Maybe things are going really well. The only other thing I would say is maybe take a look at what he's eating. If there's a lot of bloat going on, maybe you need to take a look at the fiber content and maybe bring it down a little bit. It's possible it's just too much fiber and it's causing bloat towards the end of the day. I wonder, to add to this conversation, how much of this is coming from the coach and how much of this is coming from the client? Because I don't know about you, but I would say that at least 75% of clients that I work with, they're pretty damn near obsessed with their midsection and wanting it to look a certain way. Yeah. And so there's a little bit of dysmorphic thinking in terms of what's realistic and what needs to happen while they're creating a better shape for themselves. Yeah. Right? So it's a matter of perspective. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that can definitely affect you and create bias in you as far as like how to train them and how to get them to wrap their head around what they're doing when they're working on improving their shape by putting more muscle, upper body and lower body and creating that X-frame. It's not about how strong the midsection is. It's about what the midsection looks like. So the bigger you are, upper and lower, the leaner your midsection looks. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode. Please stay in touch with us on all of our socials at Muscles by Brussels, at Vegan Protein on YouTube. Of course, right here on the podcast, you can reach out anytime, as well as on Instagram, in a private Facebook group. You can shoot us an email whenever you want. Just hit the contact button on veganproteins.com and you will reach one of us and you will get a personal response every time. Trust me, we don't miss a beat and we'd love to hear from you. So please be in touch. Once again, my name is Giacomo. And I'm Danny. And we'll talk to you soon.